England's rivers are filled with a chemical cocktail of sewage, agricultural waste and plastic. Water shortage has become a never-ending issue in one of Pakistan's largest cities, Karachi. It states in other parts of the world, which could potentially be the worst drought in 1,200 years. One possible solution to this problem is the desalination of seawater. But is it a silver bullet? Let's find out in today's video. Over 40% of the world's population is affected by water scarcity, and over 700 million people lack access to safe drinking water. The United Nations estimates that close to 2 billion people live in river basins that demand additional sources of clean water. More alarmingly, the UN estimates that as many as 250 million Africans will be residing in regions with extreme water scarcity by 2050 forcing an additional 24 to 700 million people to flee their homes due to deteriorating living circumstances. As population grows, water becomes more scarce. With the world's population set to hit 9.7 billion by 2050, there's been a pressing need to adopt new water technology to ease the strain on scarce supplies. Water desalination is one of the promoted advancements and it has been met with enthusiasm from both government officials and business leaders. There are primarily two methods used to purify water on a big scale, allowing it to be utilized to slake the thirst of millions and in other contexts, including as agriculture. One method, known as distillation, involves heating sea or salty water to draw a pure vapor, which is then cooled into liquid that is safe for drinking. Another, known as reverse osmosis, use membranes to force water through filters at high pressure in order to remove salt and other contaminants. Over 20,000 desalination facilities across the world use these methods to produce 25 billion gallons of desalinated water daily. The Middle East and North Africa account for up to 4% of global water desalination initiatives, and the global market is expected to reach 32.1 billion by 2027. Types of Desalination Technologies There are a few different kinds of desalination technologies, but they can be categorized into three broad categories. Thermal, also known as distillation, membrane, including reverse osmosis, and charge-based, which use ion exchange processes. Multiple thousand cubic meters of water can be desalinated in a day using thermal desalination systems, which makes it appealing at industrial levels. Smaller systems and those dealing with brackish water sources benefit more from desalination using a charging mechanism, more along the lines of a few hundred cubic meters a day. One of the most widely used commercial desalination processes, membrane technology, is also among the most adaptable. Of the many experiments currently under work, two have garnered significant media attention and have intriguing findings to back them up. Even if they're just two examples, they might serve as the foundation for something greater. They may not be the answer to the world's water problems, but they show us the way forward for freshwater technology, particularly in niche areas. In the middle of a desert, one of the innovations can extract water from the air with no need for filters at the push of a button and the other can get fresh water at the push of a button without any kind of power source at all. What part can they play in relieving the freshwater issue, and do they live up to the hype? We need to investigate this more. MIT Suitcase To begin, our MIT pals have designed a brand new, compact desalination equipment that can produce potable water without the use of filters or high-pressure pumps. The device is less than 22 pounds, has a suitcase's dimensions, and uses less energy than a cell phone charger. In order to force the salty water through the filters, the majority of commercially available portable desalination machines rely on high-pressure pumps, which is not only difficult to implement in a compact device, but also requires additional maintenance and energy to keep working smoothly. When compared to this, the MIT device employs a two-stage process that involves ion concentration polarization, or ICP for short. In ICP, membranes are positioned on either side of a water channel and an electric field is applied to them. In this way, the membranes are able to block the passage of positively or negatively charged particles such as salt, bacteria, and viruses. At the end of the operation, the charged particles are ejected along with a second stream of water. Since ICP doesn't always get rid of the salts that are accumulating in the channel's midsection, the scientists performed an additional round of electrodialysis to flush out the last of the lingering sodium and chloride ions. The best system, according to the study's authors, consists of a two-stage ICP procedure in which water flows through six modules in the first stage, three modules in the second, and a single electrodialysis process in the end. This setup ensured self-cleaning and little energy consumption low-cost water harvesting gel. 
But what about the towns and cities that aren't situated near water? No way, say the researchers at UT Austin. Even in arid regions, scientists have developed a gel film that can extract water from the air at a low cost, using readily available components. Just so we're clear, the concept here isn't exactly novel. The concept of making drinkable water out of thin air is an old one. Hydro panels have already entered the market, making this gel obsolete. As an oversimplification, they can be thought of as a dehumidifier attached to the rear of a solar panel. More specifically, these panels gather water vapor from the air and turn it into a liquid using solar electricity. The liquid is then mineralized and stored in a reservoir. Very little explanation is necessary. Just think of it as a dehumidifier. This water harvesting gel has similar goals, but it doesn't rely on energy to complete its job. More than six liters of water may be produced by one kilogram of this gel per day in low humidity regions less than 15% relative humidity, and up to 13 liters can be produced in high humidity regions, up to 30% relative humidity. While both are impressive, they don't exactly challenge the status quo on their own. However, they do show that there are exciting changes occurring in the market as a whole. The question then becomes, are they too good to be true? Assessing the suitcase. Let's start with a deeper inspection of that portable desalination apparatus developed at MIT. Don't forget that the groundwork for this endeavor was laid over a decade ago. At the successful testing of the prototype, the question arises as to whether or not we will soon be able to achieve efficient, effective desalination with the push of a button. How thrilled ought we be? At least we're not just doing a tiny trial in a lab. This is a true outdoor test. Yoon and Quan put the gadget through its paces in the field at Boston's Carson Beach, where they dipped the feed tube into the water and extracted a cup of potable water after 30 minutes. In addition to meeting or exceeding World Health Organization standards for quality, the amount of suspended solids in that cup of water was reduced by at least a factor of 10. And it's not bad either. Of course, the device needs to be able to produce more than just a single cup of water at a time. The prototype produces roughly 0.3 liters of drinkable water every hour while using only 20 watts of power per liter. The National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine of the United States estimate that a man in a temperate climate needs around 3.7 liters of water each day. It would take the prototype around 12 hours to collect enough water. Although reverse osmosis is commonly used in portable desalination systems, this gadget uses a different technique. With greater water recovery rates, 85 to 90 percent versus 25 to 80 for reverse osmosis, Charge-based desalination systems are preferable for use with brackish water sources. This quickly adds up because we don't want a single drop to be wasted. Furthermore, the system would also eliminate several pollutants, viruses, and bacteria. The fact that ICP is challenging the status quo of reverse osmosis as the most viable choice for smaller systems in places like islands and coastal settlements is significant. Coastal communities and locations hit by natural disasters often lack access to stable power sources which is necessary for running the many electrically powered pumps and filters needed to purify seawater. Assessing the gel. Did we mention that the water harvesting gel developed by the University of Pennsylvania is suitable for use in the desert? I don't mean to belabor the topic, but that's a neat quirk that makes this gel useful even in places where the drought has been particularly severe. This gel, like the MIT device, appears to be a low volume answer, perhaps meant to fill in for existing infrastructure in homes or smaller enterprises. The researchers claim that the initial 6-liter harvest is just the beginning. The film's malleability and adaptability make it ideal for a wide range of potential uses. For example, increasing the film's thickness or using absorbent beds could both improve efficiency and increase the amount of fresh water they produce. This isn't the only technology that can extract water from the atmosphere, but the other options need a lot of power and don't yield much. Importantly, this gel can be used indefinitely without the need for any other power source. Thermal means of acceleration are available, but not necessary. The reaction can be set it and forget it. Is there any concern about the effect on the natural world? We need to do some additional research into that. The materials themselves are said to be safe. And unlike other desalination methods, you won't end up with a harmful discharge of salty brine. Considering that several of the components, including cellulose and cognac gum, break down naturally over time, there may be eco-friendly ways to dispose of the gel mold when its useful life is through. Is it enough? You may be wondering, is this enough? Unlike other exciting advances, like fluorinated nanotubes for desalination membranes, wick-free solar setups, and a low-energy battery electrode deionization system from the University of Pennsylvania, 
The two technologies we've talked about here actually have prototypes in place and are ready to be used in the field immediately. Or at least, once the business side of things is figured out, will these solve the world's water crisis? Maybe not by themselves, and maybe not as is. However, they can help provide real-world relief, more than some places are getting, to areas hit hardest by dwindling drinking water resources. They could provide clean drinking water after a natural disaster, such as a hurricane or earthquake, and they also show where this type of research is heading. That pretty much wraps this video up, guys. Thanks for watching. So, what are your thoughts about the future of desalination? Share with us in the comments below. Make sure you subscribe to this channel with a bell notification if you enjoy watching our content. We upload some awesome stuff here, which you will most certainly enjoy. Hit a like on this video and leave a comment below. See you guys in the next one. See you.